Welcome to this episode of the 22nd Century Management with Ken. If you're watching on YouTube and haven't already done so, do me a favor, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. And if you hit the bell icon, you'll get notified when I put out a, a new episode. And there is a new episode on every Wednesday. Also, if you're listening on a podcast, do me a favor, subscribe on your favorite podcast player. Today, I'm very fortunate to have with me Susan Linder. And Susan leads intimate workshops for executives and founders and keynotes some of the largest tech and innovation conferences in the world. In the last two years, Susan has spoken to more than hundreds of thousands of conference and workshop attendees worldwide. So Susan, welcome to the show. You want to give us a little more of your background? You bet, Ken. I'd love to. I'm actually trained as an anthropologist. I don't know how many anthropologists you run across in your day, Ken, but my guess is relatively few. <laughs> so I'm an anthropologist by training, and I first spent my first 10 years after college working in healthcare. In fact, I was a public health educator in Southeast Asia. I was working in brothels in Thailand doing HIV education with prostitutes and their customers. And I came back and my last job in healthcare was at the Centers for Disease Control, looking at all the different strains of the HIV virus coming into the United States and figuring out new mechanisms for protecting Americans from HIV. So that was my last foray before diving into marketing in the dot-com boom. And so rather than getting a new degree in software engineering, I decided to get a job in public relations around tech. I thought, well, I have an AOL account. I must be able to figure out how all this tech stuff works. <laughs> and I also thought as a PR person, if I could convince a John in a Thai brothel at two o'clock in the morning to put on a condom, I could certainly convince a tech journalist to write a story about one of these amazing Silicon Valley startups. So that's how I got my job in PR. And about two years after I started my own agency called Lotus PR, and then we became emerging media with the advent of social media. And since then, I've been speaking to audiences all over the world about innovation storytelling, which is really taking taking the opportunities around what we have right in front of us and turning them into great stories that transform customers into, into really enthusiastic evangelical fans for our products and services. Okay, and it's quite interesting because I am a huge fan of storytelling. Uh, I think that it has a huge impact. But let me ask this question then. So why do you think that innovation storytelling is so important for businesses? Yeah, well, you know, it started off for me understanding why storytelling mattered when I was actually working in those brothels, right? I was really in life and death situations, but the only tool I had, the only quote unquote innovation I had was the condom. So Ken, if I were to ask you, how old do you think the condom is? How long has it been around us humans? How long do you think? I don't have an idea. So would you believe me if I told you the condom is 10,000 years old? Oh, wow. No. Yeah. <laughs> Why would you? <laughs> but, you know, as an anthropologist, we find the first evidence of condoms painted on the walls of caves in France. 10,000 years ago. So we don't know if this was a public health message or someone was bragging about last night. But the reason I bring it up is that innovation storytelling matters because sometimes we're trying to sell a product or service that frankly isn't that innovative, right? If we've had a product or service that's been with us for 10,000 years, how do we make it new, exciting, relevant, interesting, and in fact, critical? In my case, it was the only health saving device that was at my disposal living in rural rice farming Thailand. And so I realized that the story had to change, not necessarily the product. And the way that we did that was by getting really clear about turning the listener of that story into the hero of the story. So the Department of Health was using messages like get AIDS and die use a condom, as opposed to saying, let me talk to you about how your life will be transformed in the event that you decide to use this condom. 
So for me, I had three core audiences. I had the Mama Sans, they were the owners of the brothel and they were really interested in making more money. I had the customers of the brothel and I think we know what they were there for, a really good time. And finally, the sex workers themselves who were really there for survival and to support their families. By changing the story, by making them the heroes of the story, by saying to the Mama Sans, what if you could be the place that ensured people's health in the middle of this pandemic? What if you could be the place to make sure that everyone walked out of here safe and alive? And to the customer, we said, what if you could have a great time, but you also ensured that your wife and unborn children didn't get HIV while you were here? And finally, to those sex workers, we said, what if you could be in control of your own destiny, even if you were seeing eight customers a night? What if you could be in control of your own destiny, not the customer? And not only did we give them those opportunities and give them AIDS education, but we also trained them to become entrepreneurs when they didn't want to be sex workers anymore. We helped them start their own small businesses. So we painted a picture of a future that was better than the reality that they were living in in the moment. And we gave them a path to get there. And that experience of understanding how to tell a story and make the listener the hero would go on to change everything about what I understood about marketing, about relating to my own team, about always putting the listener at the center because we all wanna be the center of our, we all wanna be the hero of our own movie, right? <laughs> so when we can do that in business, we fundamentally change the game. Okay, so in business, in both on the, let's say on the sales side and on the leadership side, what is innovation storytelling in that context? Yeah, so innovation storytelling has five critical elements. So the first one, when we learn to tell a great story around innovation, we have to paint a picture of that future that nobody else can see, or at least this very ancient product. I mean, Ken, you've been in the copier business. You know what that multifunction printer life looks like. How do you keep making something that's so ubiquitous interesting to people, right? I mean, the copier is certainly not 10,000 years old, but it's pretty old in American business life, right? <laughs> so we need to make it exciting. So the first place we start with is a shared history. That's step number one. So where can we all get on the same page about what this product or service is and what it's been in our lives, whether it's been great or awful? Tell us about that shared history, where it comes up for us, where the memories are associated with that product, that shared history. And great storytelling as a reminder starts with great listening. So do we even know what our prospect or our customer or our team member, what matters to them? What's interesting or painful about, let's call it a copier? Like, what are some great memories about printing out invitations to your three-year-old's birthday party? Or maybe it's making that, you know, not so um, safe for work copy, you know, late at night when you just can't get the damn toner to function or whatever that may be. What are the funny, poignant, painful elements of our shared history? Step one. Step two is our purpose and values. So what are we hoping to achieve with this machine, this product or service? What is our, our core values around it? Do we want to make more money? Do we want to be more efficient? Do we want to be more productive? Do we want to get a raise or a promotion? What are the values and our purpose around this product or service? And again, that takes asking the prospect or asking your team member, why does it matter? Why are you even invested in this? Why do you care? Step number three is the hardest part in innovation storytelling. It's saying a new message. Something is going to now fundamentally shift that wasn't here before. So I think of the greatest viral storytellers of all time, Ken, are the prophets. Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad. These are the guys who were able to tell stories that 5,000, 2,000 years later, we're still telling these stories. When we have a message that is a breakthrough message, right? When we go for an eye for an eye to turn the other cheek, that's a message that travels around the world with 12 guys telling it. You know, it's not Twitter, it's not Facebook. It's a story that says, we can't go back to doing things the old way. And for any of your listeners who are trying to inspire change, you need a message that says, we're burning all the boats. 
These were great memories and great history we had together, but it's time for something new. And we can't go back to doing it the old way anymore. And we will not. We cannot go back that way. It doesn't work for us anymore. And in fact, on either side of that equation, there will be winners and there will be losers. And this new way of doing things is where the winners live. So that's part of innovation storytelling. And then the last two pieces of these five parts are, who are the early adopters? Can you identify those 12 apostles, those 12, uh, those other folks in your organization who will help you take the message forward so that it spreads without you? And the last piece is viral wording. So are we using messages that people can easily share? So it's really hard to have a water cooler conversation or I guess a Zoom conversation since we're not near the wa collective water cooler anymore. Can we get to the point where we're talking about what they just heard in a meeting and they can easily share it. The average headline or the average quote in the Wall Street Journal is just seven words long. So if you're speaking in diatribes endlessly, no one's going to remember it. So get your message down to a seven word soundbite so that someone can repeat it and remember it when they leave the meeting with you. Those are the five steps. Oh, well, very nice uh, and very interesting. So why should we embrace new ways of talking to both customers and team members? Because the old way is not working. The old way is not working. When you think about it, we only learn in two ways. We learn from experience and we learn from story. So it's either we went and touched the hot stove and we got burned, or our moms told us not to touch the hot stove and we'd get burned. <laughs> and so that's fundamentally how we learn. We learn about the Pythagorean theorem in a story that our teacher tells us. And then we go home that night and we do the homework and we experience the Pythagorean theorem, right? So this is the way that human beings learn. When we tell stories to each other, the brain is doing a couple of really interesting things. Number one, you tell me a story and my brain is actively looking for experiences I've had that map to whatever you're telling me. So this is how our brains are sharing information and connecting. That's number one. Number two is when we hear a really exciting story, a passionate story, a new breakthrough story, our brains are releasing adrenaline, dopamine, serotonin. We're actually releasing brain chemicals. And when that happens, when a story is what we call emotionalized, it lives in the biochemistry of the body. It stays with us. If we're just looking at an Excel sp spreadsheet or three bullet points in an email, our brains aren't set up, unfortunately, to retain any of that. And so we actually have to be cognizant about what do I want someone to feel when I tell a story so that it stays with them. So when we actually get someone to feel an emotion, we have the opportunity to get them to change. And they hold it. So you know that experience of going to the movie theater and your palms start to sweat when you watch something terrifying and your heart starts to race. That is the ability that allows you to leave the movie theater and share the experience with someone else. So if you don't inspire an emotion when you tell a story, it doesn't stick. And Stanford actually did the research for us. If you just give people statistics, within six minutes, most have forgotten it. If you wrap the statistics in a story right? We're 25% faster, we're 95% more efficient, but you actually tell it in a way that says, because we're 95% more efficient, Jack was not only able to get a raise and a promotion, but he actually got to leave at five o'clock every day and go to his kid's soccer game. Just adding those few little details allows someone to remember it. And Stanford tells us we're 22 times more likely to remember those facts and numbers when we wrap it in a story. So it's one thing to create a really great PowerPoint, but in the middle, you know, as soon as your audience leaves the room, they've forgotten it. So do yourself a favor and make your presentations more impactful by wrapping it in the story so that it actually has an impact. They can go back to their boss and make a buying decision together. And when it's with your team, when you elicit feeling from your team and they feel connected to you, you increase employee engagement and loyalty. And that's what we want from teams more than anything else is that they become self-motivated
because they carry the story with them and they're able to tell it to the next new employee. That's why storytelling matters. It holds the company together. And it's interesting because I'm a huge fan of stories and I'll share an adage with you that I heard early on in my career. And somebody said that facts tell, stories sell. It's interesting because that thought process has stayed with me. And one of the things that I encourage people that are putting things on their website to build their company up and to create credibility is to get customers to tell their story, especially if they can get it in a video form, because I think that is the most impactful testimonial. When you hear somebody tell a piece of your story in their words, it impacts you, but it also is going to impact other people because they start to see themselves in the customer's shoes. So what do you okay. think about that as a strategy? Yeah. So you've encompassed so many of those. Number one, this is something that you heard early in your career, right? And yet you're still saying it, right? This is evidence that the story still works. Number two is that viral messaging of something that rhymes. Facts tell, stories sell. That is the perfect embodiment of getting the language right because our brains are wired for a kind of rhetoric. So think about alliteration, think about rhyme, think about using phrases that people can easily repeat. And you're still repeating it decades later, right? And so you're, you're giving that evidence that it works. And you're also putting in one other piece that I love, which is aspiration. You know that your audience wants to sell more. So facts tell, stories sell. You've hooked into the desire of your prospect. That's what they want to do. They want to sell more. So you've already gotten them at their heart, not just their head. And that's what matters in sales, certainly, at least in the United States. We buy with our heart before our head. <laughs> it's interesting what you just said, because that reminds me, there's a gentleman named Pat Quinn, who is a speaking coach, and, and he works with some amazing clients. I had an opportunity to learn from him in a group setting. And one of the things that he talked about is that anytime that you want to build rapport with your audience is that you start with a story that has some emotional impact. Mm -hmm. And then he said, you want to go in and you want to teach whatever it is you want to teach. And then if you're selling that you want to come back and you do what he called an emotional close. So you come back to the story or a story that relates to what you've been teaching. Excuse me, I got the order back. Would you ask for whatever it is you want from the audience? But then you come back and do a final story because he said that what happens is that there are two kinds of people that will respond. He said, you have the people that make more logic-based decisions because all decisions are somewhat influenced by emotion. But you also have people that are more emotionally influenced. And so by telling the final piece of the story at the end, you basically secure the entire audience rather than just a fraction of it that you'd get the other one. Powerful. Yeah, Powerful. I, I, that's what I thought. I was like, okay, this makes a lot of sense. And I'm learning, I'm trying to learn to become a better storyteller in, in that process. It's interesting too, because in my training programs, I tell a lot of stories from my past about experiences that I've encountered trying to make points for the students. So I think that both of those are just kind of, uh, how do I want to say this? I think those kind of reinforce what you just said, or maybe you reinforce what I believed. Maybe that's a better way of saying it. <laughs> We're on the same uh, story either way. But you know, Ken, some, something that, um, that you got me thinking about when you were speaking too, is that there is, there is such a desire, especially in business, to tap the emotional side of life, you know, that we're not just living in these spaces. And I think it's such a unique, it's a unique leadership quality to be able to tell stories that resonate with people. And, you know, we're moving to a very data-driven world. And I'm inspired by Brene Brown when she says, what if stories are just data with a soul? And it's our job, even as we're sifting through great data to say, where's the soul? Why does it matter? And it's just taking that little bit of extra time that says, wow, we're 95% more efficient or we save you 20%, you know, when you use this product over that product. What are people doing with the time saved, the money saved, the greater efficiency? How are their lives shifting into a better place? And so don't stop at just saying, we save you time, we save you money, we make you more productive. 
What are people doing with the time and the money and the productivity? Things like getting home at five, not having to check my email at one o'clock in the morning, wondering if something's breaking down. Those are the peace of mind. Those are the qualitative sides of the sale that really set a salesperson apart. And it's the part of life that we ask for. When we buy a new product or service today, we're not just asking for an incremental benefit. We're looking for transformation. That's I want my life to be transformed when I make an investment in working with you. And so one other thing I'll share is that the way that you get that point across is by thinking about the five senses. So if you want to tell a really impactful story, think about touch, taste, sound, feeling, right? Think about, think about those things that resonate on a body level, right? We want the story to go into the body and be able to take it out into the world. So this is the most delicious copier you're ever going to find. You know, like there's, there's something about playing with words and feelings, like listen to the sound of that as it goes back and forth. It's almost inaudible. It's so quiet, like a pin drop, right? So think about ways of adding the five senses into your stories and they'll stick even more because we feel it in our body. No, that, that is so powerful. I, I love that idea. And so let me go back to my, my last question for today. And that is, how is storytelling part of becoming a better leader? Because we've talked about it from the teaching and the sales part, but let's talk some more about how it is from the leadership perspective. Right. So there's a part about leadership that's legacy. And in many cases, the legacy of a leader is the progress and what they've left behind. Ultimately, all the footprints that you leave as a leader will be shared with the people behind you as a story. So all the changes that you've made, all the impact that you've had will ultimately become story. It won't just be the balance sheet, which tells a story in its own right, but it'll be what your team says about you. And the only way that those stories will continue to get told is what Maya Angelou said to us, right? Which was, People don't remember what you said or what you did. They remember how you made them feel. And so story is the fastest way of connecting with the emotional heart of our team members, of our customers, our stakeholders, our shareholders. By connecting at the heart level, people are able to move mountains more quickly and they're able to work on your behalf more effectively. So when we actually move the heart, we move our team members. And you may say, well, my team's really motivated by money. I'm on a, you know, zero pay, straight commission only basis. Well, that's great. And don't get me wrong. I've had a couple of those positions in my life, but the leaders who motivated me to actually get out the door and go and make that next sale and that next call were people who motivated me with a story that made it matter to me. So by tying in those core values, by tying in the bottom line, the heart line, that's how you get the most productive people. And frankly, those are the people who wind up recruiting on your behalf. So I think sometimes in business, the hardest time as a leader is to put the right A team in place, getting your other team members to draw like a magnet, the best new hire, that employee engagement level only happens with great recognition, obviously good commission structures and pay, and the story that keeps people bound to you and keeps more people coming into the organization. And the other piece of leadership, so that's the top down. The other is speaking up, right? Is talking to your CEO, your C-suite executives, because you may not be the entrepreneur in your business or the CEO of your business. Telling stories about your team, finding ways to make other people shine that you've brought on board, is the humility that leaders can bring to the C-suite and say, I don't want to talk about me. I want to talk about my team. I want to talk about what we've accomplished together. I've just put the mechanisms in place. Let me tell you stories about what my team has accomplished. These numbers don't paint the whole picture. Allow me to do that for you. That's your job is bringing the soul back to the data, even when you're reporting to shareholders and C-suite executives. I love that. And I love the concept. And in one of the, oh, let's say memes that I use in a slide, it talks about the fact 
that leaders say what we accomplished. But when there's blame to be had, the leader says it's my fault. That's right. And because I think that sharing what your team has accomplished in, in doing that, I love what you said about the humility it shows. Uh, I also think that it inspires, because when your team knows that that's the way you approach things, I think that becomes part of their story about you, that he doesn't take the credit, he gives us the credit. That's and right. I think that is powerful both directions. I love that little piece of it. Yeah, it's leaders, like accomplishments start with we and blame starts with me. Responsibility starts with me. And it was interesting because I want to go back to, to stories for a second because you talked about leaders and I had a leader that I worked for uh, when I was in the military and this gentleman's name was Sergeant Gillis. And I tell this story in my class because I, I use it as an example. I was in a situation where as a junior NCO, I had to interview pilots coming back from missions. Pilots were always officers and included in that group was the base commander. And mm -hmm. he said, I don't care if it's the base commander sitting in front of you. His job when he's sitting in your chair is to give you the information you need. It is not to refly the mission. He said to me that in the event that he has a problem, you tell him to see me. I have your back. Okay. And so that is a story that I tell in how to become a leader, but it's a story because I experienced it and he inspired that in me. And I, I think that's a good example of how stories can help. That's right. That's right. So powerful. Yeah, and that was, and to put it in perspective, that was 40 years ago. That that right. And you're, and you're still telling the story. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so this is how the human brain, this is how we are all hardwired. It would be great if our brains were hardwired for Excel spreadsheets and PowerPoints, but the reality is we're not. <laughs> this is how we get information, experience and stories. That's it. That's how the brain, human brain is wired. Well, and, and it's interesting you say that because how did we learn, go back to when writing wasn't common and we go back in time, people learn from stories and Socrates taught his students by stories primarily. It wasn't the books he wrote. He's not known for writing books, but he, he was known as, as a philosopher and an instructor because he told stories. You know, and so I think that, again, going back to the way we were designed is that our, our brain works better when we hear stories. Uh, I can go back and tell lots of stories. In fact, my granddaughter uh, did a, an hour with me of me telling stories about the family. But those will now become part of her history. That's right. And so I told stories about her great grandfather. She never met him. And now she'll have that to, to, to take with her. Actually, it would have been her great, great grandfather. And, and you so know, Ken, I mean, executives, all of us listening, right, who are working in business can also get really strategic about stories. I don't want to, um, I don't want to make the case that we're just here to move hearts, right? And this is some kind of soft skill because it's not we can get really strategic about how we want to move the audience that's sitting across from the table with us. So step number one is empathy, right? Is really doing a very good job of listening to what the person across the table needs from us. When we go to craft that story of what we want to share with them, we can get incredibly strategic about the points that we want to get across. Very important in negotiation as well. And to think about what are the emotions that we actually want to trigger. So I'll give you an example, and it starts off as a non-business example, but I'll get there. When's the last time you saw the movie Bambi, Ken? Uh, been years. Yeah. So Walt Disney was a master. If you happen to notice at Disney, they're obsessed with heroes of Disney stories being orphans or having lost their mother. Now, why did Walt Disney do that? He did that because the opening scene of Bambi, as you know, Bambi's mom gets shot by a hunter. And those little kids who are watching that film are absolutely fixated because there is no greater horror in the world than for a child to lose his or her mommy. And I learned this being the stepmom to the children of a widower. And so when I watched Bambi with them and I saw their little faces go, mommy's dead. It blew my mind. And I thought that Walt Disney is a bastard. But <laughs> what I realized was he was able to put those children in the palm of his hand 
because he had triggered this fear and this adrenaline rush like nobody's business. And the only thing that that person, that viewer was waiting for was relief. So suddenly Bambi again then gets to know Thumper and all of his other forest friends, right? And there's a semblance of normalcy that comes back and Bambi learns to live in the forest, right? There is a happy ending to the Bambi story in the end. But when we talk to customers, we can actually think about what are the neurochemicals that I want to inspire in my listener's brain? So let's talk about what life is like if I don't buy that copier today. Let's talk about what life looks like if I decide not to burn my boats, if I keep up with the status quo. Can you paint a picture for me of how awful it's going to be if I keep going in the same direction, right? For my, for my ladies in Thailand, it was, what happens if I don't use that condom? What if I keep going playing Russian roulette with my life? What happens if I don't buy this product or service? That's the adrenaline rush that Walt Disney would have used in a sales discussion. And now I say, let's talk about how life gets better. Let's talk about if we decide to move into the world of innovation and making a change of purchasing something new, let me paint a picture for you about what life in the forest, what life in the office, what life with your bottom line is going to look like next. Now comes the serotonin, the dopamine, all of those feel good chemicals that get released in the brain when you can tell a story about a better future. And so we have a lot to learn from the Pixar's and the Walt Disney's of the world about the emotions that we physically put into someone's body for a strategic business interest. It feels like manipulation, but that is how we learn. And one other thing I just wanna share, if we think about the analogy of like Star Wars, I wanna remind everyone who's selling a product or service that the hero of the story is Luke Skywalker. It is not the lightsaber. So even as you're telling the story, your product never becomes the hero. The person using the product or service is the hero. And they accumulate other friends along the way, like Han Solo and Leia, right? Who's in other departments who can now help us make this dream a reality, right? Where we actually wind up winning the big battle at the end and we get to the happy ending. And the last thing I wanna say about that is, you're in chapter one of storytelling. If you want to keep selling more and more copiers or you want to keep selling more and more products and services, you need lots of chapters to the story. So there's not just one story that we tell. We need many stories over time to keep people coming back for more. I'm going to go back to one thing that I heard, and I love this, and it ties right into that, was they said that you should keep a story journal. Yes, I do. Where's mine? This is mine. Every time I get a new idea, I just go, oh, right, that was really good. Like I watched somebody in line at the Starbucks and how the barista was really funny and kind. And I'll just jot down that little story about customer experience. And so for those that are listening that are in the sales world, when you think about being able to talk to your customer, the more stories that you develop and record things that happen and think about how it made you feel, then what starts to happen when you're talking to customers or as a business leader talking to your team, the more stories you have to draw from, the more effective you'll be as a powerful storyteller. That's right. And you should label them. So think about, is this a customer experience story? Is this a sales story, a closing story, a negotiation story? And label it with the emotion that it made you feel. Oh, that's powerful. I hadn't thought about labeling it with the emotion. So that is so good. Mm. I appreciate very much having you on, Susan. So if somebody wants to learn more about being disruptive and innovative uh, and would like to work with you, how are some of the ways they can get a hold of you? Yes. So if you find yourself struggling with a new product or service that you're ready to bring to market or you're trying to get your teams on board with trying to turn something from a prototype into like a full-fledged thing and you can't get people on board with you, I'm the woman to help. So <laughs> if you're struggling with that, innovators are great at innovating, but have a tougher time telling the stories around their innovation. And I'm here to help with that. So you can go to susanlinder.com and you can take a look at some of the talks and workshops that I give. I'm also coming out with a book called Innovation Storytellers and get the resources, runway and recognition you deserve. So it's the blueprint for how to tell an innovation story. And then lastly, my own podcast is going to be coming out and that's called Innovation Storytellers as well, where you can hear 
some of the brightest minds from GE and Tesla and Corning Glass and wonderful, wonderful innovators who are really taking the world by storm and have amazing stories to tell about how they did it. Okay, and what we will do, Susan, and just so that it's easy for everybody, is in the comments down below or in the description, what you'll find is you'll find links to all of Susan's contact information. As soon as her book comes out and it's on Amazon, I'll post a link there. So if you're looking for information on Susan, you can find it down below. And I have enjoyed our conversation so much. Oh, me too, Kev. This has been great. Thank you for having me. You're quite welcome. For those that might have questions, you can put them in the comments. We'll respond to any of those. I will make sure that Susan gets that information. And again, if you haven't subscribed, please do so. And we'll see you next week.